I'm about to show you the seven most common antagonist mistakes that new fantasy writers make. Without a strong antagonist, your story is going to be boring because there'll be no meaningful challenge for your main character to struggle against. And making just one of these mistakes could turn your otherwise terrifying antagonist into something that is less threatening than getting slapped in the face with a small wet fish. How do I know about these mistakes? Well, over the past 10 years, I've had to learn about many of these errors the hard way in my own writing. And over the past year, I've edited over 20 different fantasy novels for various writers, and I've also run over 100 story coaching calls to help authors improve their stories. And in those calls and in that editing, I've seen many of these mistakes come up again and again. So let's help you avoid those mistakes in your fantasy book. And to start with, it's very important to understand the five antagonist archetypes. Let's go through these now. And for each of them, I'm going to provide examples along with outlining the benefits and the risks of each archetype. First, we have the force of nature. This is a destructive entity that cannot be reasoned with, bargained with, or persuaded to stop. Like a typhoon or a raging fire, it is impossible to change its path. Examples here include characters like Sauron, the Shandrian from The Name of the Wind, Voldemort, the High Storm in the Stormlight Archive, and the Dementors from Harry Potter. Now, the risk of writing this type of antagonist is that conflict against them might feel repetitive or stale. They may also lack the ability to challenge your main character on a meaningfully moral level, although of course, there are exceptions to this. Sauron, for example, challenges Frodo constantly by tempting him to take up the ring and gain its power. But the benefit to writing this type of antagonist is they have the ability to produce a great sense of fear within the reader due to the primal, unchanging nature of this entity. It can also allow your story to have a greater focus on your protagonists and their allies because the threat of the villain is more self-apparent and doesn't necessarily need as much setup to establish them. The second antagonist archetype is the false ally. This is a character that initially begins as a friend to your main character, but over the course of the story, there is some kind of betrayal or twist where we realize that they're actually working against the protagonist instead. Examples here include characters like Professor Quirrell, who Harry initially thinks is a benevolent professor at Hogwarts, but eventually is revealed to be working with Voldemort, or other Lord of the Rings characters like Boromir, who begins as part of the Fellowship, then somewhat betrays Frodo by trying to take the ring from him, of course has a wonderful redemption after that as well. And another Lord of the Rings character here, Saruman, who initially is seen to be this wise old wizard, who is revealed to have been corrupted by Sauron's influence. Now, the risk in writing this type of antagonist is it's very dependent on that betrayal twist. You need to make sure it's set up well enough that it doesn't feel like it's out of the blue, but you also don't want it to be too heavy handed. You don't want readers to see it coming necessarily. And also you've got to make sure that you build up this character's motivations for betraying the main character in a justified way. However, on the flip side of that, the benefit of this antagonist archetype is that their betrayal can form a really interesting twist. It creates a lot more complexity and it creates this tension kind of out of nowhere. It also might force your main character to question their worldview as they think, how could this person possibly betray me? I don't know who I can trust anymore. Our third antagonist archetype is the Dark Mirror. This is an inverted or corrupted version of the protagonist. Essentially, it's what the protagonist would look like if their life took a turn for the worst. Examples here include characters like Darth Vader, Golem, the Nazgul from Lord of the Rings, and one of my personal favorites here, Umbridge from the Harry Potter series. You might be thinking, how is she a dark mirror of a character? She doesn't seem like Harry. And you're correct. She's not a dark mirror of Harry. She's a dark mirror of Professor McGonagall. Both of these characters are extremely obsessed with order and following the rules, but Umbridge takes it kind of to an extreme and is physically punishing students who break out of the rules. Now, the risk of writing this type of antagonist is if you're too on the nose about their similarities to your main character, you run the risk of making them a little bit too cliched. We're not so different, you and I. However, the benefit here is that they can really offer a compelling contrast to highlight your protagonist's growth. There's also a really great opportunity here to explore your story's theme from a different inverted angle to what your main character is exploring it from. Our fourth antagonist archetype is the anti-villain. So you've probably heard about the concept of an anti-hero before. An anti-villain flips that on its head. There's someone that has positive or admirable goals, personality traits, and virtues, but the means they use to actually reach those goals are considered disagreeable with the reader, either because they are immoral means and they're kind of using the ends to justify the means here, or simply because they are in opposition to the protagonist. To quote James Baldwin, nobody is more dangerous than he who imagines himself pure in heart, for his purity by definition is unassailable. 
Examples here include characters like Magneto, I would say Sandan Glocker from the First Law series fits in here pretty nicely too, although you could make the argument that he's more of an anti-hero as well. The Lord Ruler from Brandon Sanderson's Mistborn series certainly fits here too, and so does Thanos from Infinity War and Endgame. So what's the risk in writing this type of antagonist? Well, the big one is that your reader might grow too sympathetic towards them, and they might actually find themselves distanced from the main character of your story. Of course, if that's the effect you're trying to create, by all means, go for it. And that really leads into the benefit of this antagonist archetype, which is that they create a tremendous sense of moral ambiguity that can enrich your story and challenge the reader's sense of right and wrong. It also has the potential to make the conflict more personal and emotionally complex. And then our fifth and final antagonist archetype is the shapeshifter. This is someone who is occasionally an ally to the protagonist, but sometimes works against the protagonist's goals instead. Really, it seems like their true nature is in a constant state of flux. However, you might also develop a shapeshifter's arc so that they bend towards or away from the main character over the course of your book or your series. Examples here include characters like Severus Snape, Jamie Lannister, Toral Sadius from the Stormlight Archive, Mr. Wednesday from American Gods by Neil Gaiman, and one of my personal favorites, Lord Vetinari from Terry Pratchett's Discworld series. Basically characters that feel really complex and that feel like they're always just out for themselves. So the risk in writing this particular type of antagonist is that they can confuse readers if their motivations are not eventually made clear, or if their actions lack a certain sense of consistency. You've also got to be very careful that you don't just use them as a plot device to do whatever the story demands. You have to make sure they're always acting in character and there's always a logic behind the shape-shifting path they're taking through the plot. However, the great benefit to this character archetype is that they can introduce a tremendous amount of uncertainty and suspense into your narrative, which makes for wonderfully complex and intriguing antagonists that keep readers guessing. So when it comes to writing the antagonist in your fantasy novel, the first mistake you might make is not being clear on the archetype that you're using. And it's really important to be clear because it's gonna guide you in what you need to do to develop that character. For example, if you're writing a force of nature antagonist, you probably don't need to worry about making them sympathetic. But if you are writing a anti-villain or a dark mirror, you will need to put much more work into building their sympathy. And also I should mention that none of these archetypes are superior to each other. You can have multiple of these archetypes in one story and your characters can even shift and change between different archetypes as your story progresses. But whatever archetype you pick, it's crucial that you don't fall victim to the next mistake. And to explain this one, I need to tell you a quick story about a young boy who's thrown into a gladiatorial arena to fight against a 10 foot giant of a man who wields this massive club studded with spikes. This giant has murdered three dozen victims in this arena. And all that the little boy has to fight against this giant is a rock and a sling. So yes, you've probably heard this one before because I am talking of course about David and Goliath. David, of course, being the young boy who uses the sling and the rock to defeat Goliath the giant. Spoilers for a 2000 year old story there, sorry. But the point being, if you're reading that scene, who are you gonna be rooting for? It's probably gonna be David, the young boy. Why? Because he's been presented as the underdog and the taller and stronger and more threatening we make his opponent, Goliath, the more we're gonna be rooting for David and the more deeply we will celebrate his victory. And so this is why it's usually a mistake to make your antagonist the underdog. You want them to be the overdog instead. You want them to be more powerful, more threatening, more in control than your protagonist. Although of course, with all of these mistakes, you can subvert them if you know what you're doing. For example, in The Incredibles, Syndrome begins as this snot-nosed little sidekick with no real powers, but over the course of the story, he becomes far more powerful than Mr. Incredible. And of course, power takes on so many different domains. For example, in Brent Weeks' The Lightbringer series, which is absolutely fantastic, Gavin Guile is our main character. He is the most powerful magic user in all of the lands. He's the ruler of this kingdom. You might say, well, there's no way that he's an underdog. But when you compare him against his father, Andros Guile, who might be this old, feeble man who can't use his magic because he's afraid about going insane, who is confined to his room and is physically weak, it doesn't really matter that he is physically weak because Andros Guile is tremendously cunning and smart. And even though Gavin has all this magical ability, Andros's intellect allows him to constantly get the better of Gavin and to manipulate things to go according to his schemes. But just making a powerful antagonist is not enough. Your story is gonna fail if you make the next mistake with your antagonist. And to explain this one, there's somebody I need to confront. And that person I wanna confront is Evil Jed. Can you put the hood back on? You look too similar to me like this. Do you remember when I said, we're not so different, you and I? Right, okay. Anyway, let's imagine that I have a banana and I wanna eat a banana. And I also have a banana. Great.
great. There's no reason for us to fight. Did you spot the problem? Let's try that again. Now let's imagine another scenario where both of us discover this one banana and both of us are hungry. Your protagonist and your antagonist should be fighting over the same thing. Otherwise, there's no conflict. Think about Lord of the Rings. Everybody wants a piece of the One Ring. Sauron obviously wants to get the ring back so that he can take over Middle-earth. But Sauron also wants to claim the ring so that he can destroy Sauron and basically take his place. Boromir wants to use it to protect Gondor. Gollum has been corrupted by the ring and wants to steal it from Frodo. And even Galadriel is tempted and at one point, it almost looks like she's going to take it and become this new Dark Queen. And as a side note too, the ring itself is an antagonist. I would categorize it as a force of nature archetype. Now, there's a ton of different ways that you can get your characters to be fighting over the same thing. It doesn't need to be as literal as that example. It can be done in a more metaphorical sense. For example, maybe your protagonist and your antagonist are attacking and exploring the theme of your story from different perspectives and from different angles. Or maybe they're both competing in some contest where there can only be one winner. Maybe instead, your antagonist is this eldritch entity that doesn't even know about the protagonist, but this eldritch entity needs to eat Earth to survive. And of course, your protagonist lives on that Earth and it doesn't want to die. So they're going to fight each other because both of them can't achieve their goals at the same time. And really that's the critical point here. Have them play in a zero sum game where it's impossible for them to both win. That's how you generate meaningful tension and conflict. So you have defined your antagonist's archetype. You've made them into a credible threat and then you've set them on a collision course with your protagonist. But there's still a very critical mistake you want to avoid every single time that your antagonist makes a choice or develops a plan. We'll get into that in a moment, but first I want to mention that one of the best ways to avoid these mistakes I'm talking about in this video is to construct an outline for your book. And that's because a good outline provides a clear objective overview of your story so that you can easily see if there's any issues with your antagonist. And if you would like me to personally help you with the outline for your fantasy book, which will include looking at your antagonist along with all your other characters, your plot, your structure, your world building, and every other aspect of your fantasy novel, then you might want to apply for my seven week fantasy outlining bootcamp. In this bootcamp, you'll join a small group of motivated fantasy writers as we go through a series of live workshops and feedback sessions to help you level up your fantasy storytelling. Here's what a recent student said. Suffice to say this course was revelatory for me. This was by far the best decision I've ever made in my writing journey, and it's kickstarted my quest to actually become a writer. My perspective on outlines and the purpose they serve, that was completely stripped bare and rebuilt correctly now. By the end, I had a firm understanding of actually how to approach storytelling. This program is highly selective with only a maximum of 10 students per cohort, just to make sure you get plenty of one-on-one -on -one time with me. So you will need to submit an application and it is difficult to get in, but you can do that by going to jedhern.com forward slash outline or use the link in the description down below. So to avoid this next mistake with your antagonist, you basically want to step into their shoes and then... Whenever I'm about to do something, I think, would an idiot do that? And if they would, I do not do that thing. I love that because all too often, fantasy writers make their antagonists do stupid things. And it's usually for two reasons. One, the plot kind of needs them to do this dumb decision. Or two, they need to do it to keep your main character alive. But please, I'm begging you, don't do that. Instead, just force your protagonist to be better. Remember, the more pressure you apply to your main character, the greater the depth of their true nature that is revealed through the choices they make. An incredibly useful tool here that every writer should read through entirely is the Evil Overlord list, which is essentially this list of 100 things that you should never do if you are some evil character in a movie or a book. And it was compiled by Peter Anspach. Here are some of my absolute favorite gems from the list. 12. One of my advisors will be an average five-year-old child. Any flaws in my plan that he is able to spot will be corrected before implementation. 36. I will not imprison members of the same party in the same cell block, let alone the same cell. 40. I will be neither chivalrous nor sporting. If I have an unstoppable super weapon, I will use it as early and often as possible instead of keeping it in reserve. And the reason why many fantasy writers might make these silly decisions for their antagonists is because they are making the next mistake, which is lacking a logical motivation for your antagonist. Like I said at the top of the video, depending on which antagonist archetype you choose, that's gonna affect the level of sympathy that you want readers to feel towards your antagonist. So if you're picking something like the force of nature, you don't really need them to be that sympathetic, but if you are writing an anti-villain, you do want to have a degree of sympathy there. Regardless, there needs to be a strong logical purpose behind your antagonist's actions. And in almost every single story I have personally edited, you are almost going to write a stronger narrative when you make a genuine attempt to see your protagonists 
from the eyes of your antagonist, from your antagonist's perspective. And what that means is that you shouldn't just make your antagonist one dimensionally evil. Don't have them say something like, oh, these petty rebels should be crushed beneath the might of my empire. Because that is something that's just such a clearly villain thing to say. And regardless of what you think about your antagonist, pretty much everyone sees themselves as the hero of their own story. And if they don't see themselves as the hero of their own story, they probably at least see themselves as the victim of their own story. And whatever actions they're taking feel justified because of past traumas or past events. Either way, give your antagonist reasons that make sense. I am begging you here because the number of times I read stories where they just don't have a logical motivation, it's really frustrating. And it's one of the things that will make readers not fall in love with your narrative. But when you can do this, it does create something very important for your protagonist. And to explain what this is and how this works, we need to move on to mistake number six, not forcing your protagonist to make hard choices. Perhaps the primary function of the antagonist is to force your main character to make difficult choices. Bonus points if these choices feel impossible where both options are equally bad. To help you with this, I'm gonna walk you through five different choice types that your antagonist might pressure your main character to make. Number one, moral dilemmas. The antagonist might be forcing your main character to choose between their own needs and the greater good. Or the protagonist might be forced to choose between getting revenge for themselves or showing mercy and allowing the antagonist to go unpunished. Or perhaps they have to choose between revealing a painful truth about themselves or maintaining a lie for perceived greater good. Perhaps instead, the protagonist has to decide whether to adopt morally questionable methods to achieve a seemingly righteous end. Choice type two, relationship conflicts. Maybe the antagonist might force the protagonist to doubt the loyalty of a close ally. Or maybe the protagonist is put into a position where their personal affections and their larger responsibilities are having to square off against each other. Or maybe instead, the protagonist has to choose between two different friends and they could only maintain one while the other must be sacrificed as a result of the antagonist's pressure. Choice type three, survival choices. Maybe the protagonist is put in a situation where they have to choose between saving themselves or saving others. Maybe they're having to decide whether to confront the antagonist directly or to retreat and regroup. Or perhaps they have to choose between their own personal freedom or the promise of safety or security. And then choice type four, identity challenges. Maybe your protagonist has to choose between their own values and the expectations of society. Maybe your antagonist forces them to have to abandon an aspect of their past or shut off a potential possibility from their future. And those are really just starting points. There are so many different options here. Now, from all of those mistakes we've gone through so far, you're probably noticing the interconnected nature of character design, which brings us to our next mistake, building your antagonist in isolation. If your antagonist feels weak, it's probably because they are not perfectly designed to target your protagonist. You wanna be creating your protagonist and your antagonist in parallel so that they create the maximum challenge for each other. And you do this by asking, how can I make my antagonist uniquely gifted at targeting my main character's biggest weaknesses? So if your protagonist is physically strong and has powerful magic, make his opponent someone who can't be physically attacked. And so instead, the character can't use their sword to resolve this issue, but instead they have to use their words, which puts them at a great disadvantage compared to their more witty, intelligent antagonist. If your protagonist instead relies on fear to defeat her enemies, give her a foe who is not easily intimidated, who approaches physical conflict with reckless abandon. If your protagonist needs her aunt to provide emotional stability as she tries to run this turbulent empire, have your antagonist figure out a way to corrupt that aunt or take away her influence from the main character. Look at all your characters as part of an interconnected web. Every time you develop more details about one character, that should flow into a new understanding about the other people in your story. And to make sure you're going through this process of building a great protagonist and a great antagonist in unison, it's very important to avoid the 10 most common main character mistakes that I see new fantasy writers make all the time. So if you wanna learn what these mistakes are and how to avoid them, then click on this video over here.